Hello, good evening, welcome. This is my first uh, video of 2021. And I was actually going to do it um, before New Year, but I didn't get around to it because um, at the end of my video, I think it was Gillian Welsh was doing, I mentioned I was going to do something that had a, had a, a slight Christmas connection. Uh, well, this is the one. Uh, I'm delving into the world of English folk rock tonight with uh, one of my favourite bands, again from my teenage years. Again, one band that didn't really stretch beyond my teenage years and the, 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 my kind of interest of them, and that is Steel Eye Span. So, um, a very interesting uh, folk rock band from the era. Still going strong today, apparently. Um, I've, like I said, I didn't really follow them much after my teenage years, but they're still around. I have absolutely no idea who is in the band anymore or what they're doing or what albums they've been releasing over the last... Uh, few decades but um they're definitely one band I was very much into um, in, in the early days um folk music for me particularly English folk music was something I'd grown up with um through school the primary school I was at we always used to have folk singing as part of the weekly curriculum um uh, we did some American stuff as well but it was mostly English folk songs and folk songs were always around at carnivals and fun fairs and um in pubs and all kinds of things. Not not that I was going to pubs in my primary school days, but uh, they've it's always been around. Of course, growing up in England, uh, you can't really escape it. So uh, I've always had a kind of interest in it. It's um, fascinating. Steel Eye Spam were the one band that really um, hooks me in. At the time when I was about 13, I think I got into them. Um, they're closely connected with another folk rock band of the era called Fairport Convention, um, who were slightly earlier, and they started slightly earlier than Steel Eye Spam. Both formed by the same person, uh, a bass player called Ashley Hutchins, bass player and um, folk music historian. Uh, he formed Fairport, I was called co-found Fairport Convention with uh, Richard Thompson and the rest of the rest of the gang in the in the sixties. They were originally marketed as a English uh, uh, equivalent of Jefferson Airplane. I think that was the, that was the original plan, but um, they kind of like erred more towards folk music and. And in 1969, they released three albums, which um, was their um, epicenter of creativity. I, um, which I think, I mean, that, that's my opinion, but I think everyone else's opinion as well. To do three albums in one year is something, but to do three great albums in one year is amazing. Uh, but also, sadly, the same year, they um, experienced a horrendous um, crash uh, with their um, tour van crashing, um, where injuring many people and killing the drummer. Uh, a guy called Martin Lamble, I think he was. And uh, after that, oh, incoming. After um, after that, Ashley Hutchins decided uh, it was too much of him, and he left the band. Mm -hmm. And uh, the following year, 1970, formed Steel Ice Band, uh, which had um, uh, what what he did was he he grouped together two touring folk duos, namely um, Tim Hart and Maddie Pryor who were touring together doing the folk club circuit uh, as a duo, and the husband and wife team of uh, Gay and Terry Woods. Um, they did one album together with that lineup, and then um, in the in the in the true style of uh, English bands and uh, almost like very almost like prog rock bands, they uh, sort of like had a different lineup with almost every album since. But you know, not, that's a bit of an exaggeration. But they have, they have had, they have had many lineups, um, and I think Maddie Pryor. Um, She's not a constant member. I think she did leave once. She's probably the the band member that has been with them the longest. Anyway, um, yeah, so they basically they did um, not totally rocked up versions uh, originally, but uh, they uh, they they just like brought brought the traditional folk music to um, to um, a new audience. Basically, that's what they did. Um, it all kind of started with Bob Dylan, really, in the the folk music uh, revolution in the sixties in in the states. People like um, Woody Guthrie before that as well. So um, traditional folk music was being, you know, it was, it was sort of like building and building. And um, I think what Steel Span did, they just sort of like expanded it a little bit more and um, produced a, a good, a great run of albums, particularly through the seventies. Um, There's some good stuff. Um, I got into them, like I say, around seventy-three with a Christmas single. That's what got me into them, and. Um, more about that later, but yeah, I've got um, some albums here to talk about. I've, um, I'm not doing a, a total ranking because, to be honest, I've not really followed them since uh, probably the mid '80s. 
So I've got a top 10, top 10 studio albums of Steel Ice Band to present here. Okay, so they, um, they a lot of their, um, like I said, they're mostly traditional. They're, they're pretty much 99.9% .9 traditional songs. They did um, later start to write a few of their own their own tracks, but uh, they are, um, a lot of them are from the uh, child ballads. Um, uh, Francis, the American historian Francis Child uh, collected a lot of English songs. I think 300 and something, 305 I think it was. And they became known as child ballads. So a lot of the Steel House Band songs are from the child ballad catalogue, from the catalogue there. Um, some are from other sources. Um, there's, there's, quite, there's always quite a lot of detail in their albums about where the, the songs originated and the little histories around them, which is always quite interesting. But uh, anyway, let's, let's, let's start, shall we? Um, I'm going to start with. Um, I've got some notes down here. You, know, you always need some notes with these bands with different lineups <laughs> to, to, to make sure you're talking about the right people and the right album. Um, I'm going to start, yeah, start with number 10 in my little rundown. And uh, 1980, their, their first album in the 80s. And um, an album called Sales of Silver. With a rather interesting little. Bit of art there. The, the art was by uh, Adrian Chesterman, who was a um, fine artist, did the artwork for that, who's also worked with them on another album, which I'll talk about a bit later. Uh, his most famous album sleeve, I, I would imagine, would be Motorhead's Bomber album, which he did the artwork for. So, working with Bomb, we're working with Motorhead and Steel Ice Band, that's uh, pretty good. Pretty good for the portfolio. But yeah, Sales of Silver came out in. Uh, this was a. Um, uh, they had, they basically, they were, they were signed with Chrysalis Records and they owed them one more album. So it's a, con a contractual obligation album, this in many ways. Um, and uh, what they did was their, their classic lineup, which I'll talk about a bit later, and it was you had their, with, with which they had their biggest success in the mid 70s, reformed for this album uh, to, to finish their, their Chrysalis um, obligations. And um, it was so it was a bit of a comeback album for them, but this is the one where they actually wrote most of the stuff themselves. So it's it's all still very much in the, in the style and uh, with lots of um, uh, historical references. But um, they they did basically write most of the stuff on it. it it's, it's not a brilliant sound, but it was pretty good. I saw them a couple of times on this tour because it came with um, a tour um, that kept seems to go on for ages. Actually, they kept coming back and doing adding more dates on, but. Um, there's some good tracks. You've got Sales of Silver, title track's pretty good. Uh, My Love, which is a traditional song. There, there are a couple of traditional songs on, on here. Uh, My Love is one. I think the one is Marigold Harvest Home, which I think they're jigs. What's what another thing they do, do they do lots of jigs and reels and lots of uh, instrument, instrumental stuff kind of like snuck in on uh, at least at least one on every album. Uh there's a song about Barnet Fair, which is it's called it's Cockney Rhyming for Hair. And um, uh, the song that struck me here was uh, one called Gone to America, which finishes side one, which was um, about the uh, the convicts being shipped overseas during, during, the, um, during the days of the British Empire. And it's, it's famous, of course, that a lot of them were shipped to Australia, but um, little was known, uh, well, for me anyway, about the ones that were shipped out to, um, to the States. And this is about Gone to America, and it's all about um, working the, um, the cotton fields and the... the Tobacco plantations out. Of, I think particularly in Virginia. I think they talk about on this, but um, but yeah, it was an in, in, interesting album. It was good to get the classic lineup back together for one more time. I think this is the only the only time they did that. This is one one reformation. Did the tour, did the album, and that was it. And um, yeah, so number ten in my Steel Ice Band rundown. Sales of silver. Right, we're going back to the um, uh, Steel Ice Band mark. Two was this? Did I find Mark Two? I think it was. Yes, I think it was. And this was their third release. Came out in nineteen seventy-one. And it's um, it's called Ten Man Mop, or Mister Reservoir Butler Rides Again. Uh, an interesting photograph on the front there. Um, a few uh, a, a mop. When I when I first said I thought a mop. What's that about? Is it a mop and bucket? But a mop apparently it was a, it was a trade uh, a mop fair. It was a trade fair. Um, where people used to um, go to look for work, basically. So it was a bit like um, conferences and expos they have now uh, around the world. And um, it was um, yes, one of those things. I suppose a ten-man mop is uh, someone who's taking on ten people. Uh, and I require ten people for this job. Come to my mop fair and uh, I'll give you the... 
the, the, the photo is I mean, interesting that it's um, from one of these fairs. It's uh, taken by um, Sir, John, Sir John Benjamin Stone, I think it was called. He was a photographer, social history photographer, and this, uh, they were called um, Sippers and Topers. Um, I, th- I can't remember where where it was taken. It was somewhere in Warwickshire, I think. And uh, one of these fairs was there. And the, the town it was in was renowned for its uh, large consumption of alcohol by the locals. So, um, Tippers and Soapers, that was, a, uh, that was in the name of it. And this is, like I say, by um, the second of the Steel Ice Band Mark II. And also the final album with Ashley Hutchins himself. There it is, Ashley. There's a band on the back there. Ashley Hutchins is uh, the chap there with the shades on. Who um, from his uh, time with Steel and Spell went on to form another classic folk rock band called the Albion Band. So he was, he just got itchy feet every time. I think I'm, saying, well, I'm fed up with this band. I want to form another band. So off he went. But yeah, so some good tracks. It's a great, great track and a great album actually. Um, you got Gal with Sale opens it up, which is actually a Christmas, variation of Christmas Christmas Carol. A couple of jigs on side one. Paddy Clancy's jig and uh, Willie Clancy's fancy, which I think are um, related to horse horse racing. Four Nights Drunk was a, is a classic track, a classic folk tune. When I was on horseback, great song. There's a couple of reels on this, um, which I think uh, where are the reels? They're in the middle of side two, um, which are pretty good. We the Wee Weaver, Scooball, yeah, some some good good stuff on here. It's um, nice pack. I, I do love the album sleeve. As I said, like real nice. Classic retro look about it, and it was their second album of seventy one, and um, yeah, the, like I said, the final final one with um, with Hutch, and the the second with uh, Steel Span Mark Two, and I think actually it may have been the final with yeah with with Hutch leaving, it was the, the final album with Steel Span Mark Two. Anyway, Ten Man Mop, or Mister Reservoir Butler rides again, in at number nine in my Steel Span Top Ten. Okay. I mentioned before the the lineup that formed reformed for Sales of Silver was the considered the classic lineup for their most successful period, and this was a centerpiece of their most successful period, coming in at number eight in my ranking, all around my hat, with that rather lovely uh, lovely painted sleeve uh, by who did the um, John O'Connor I think it was did the artwork for that, and it's um it's an anamorphic projection. Uh, which was um, something that's been in, in art for a long, long time. Um, I think Holbein. What was that Holbein painting? Oh, gosh. Uh, the Ambassador, I think it was. And it's a painting of a just typical historical painting, but in the foreground was just this splurge of something going across the front. And it's actually a skull. So if you, if you go, to one, go to the right position against the side of the canvas, you can see this skull. And the, what they've done here with the, the insert, got the six members of the band on the front and back and what they have on the lyric sheet there are these little um, peepholes so you put it against the edge of the sleeve and look down the right peephole and you can see the person as it should be so it's a clever clever bit of art really it's um, quite nicely done but anyway the, this album like I say this was their biggest hit this was their biggest selling album and to this day I think it still is with the classic lineup of Maddie Pryor, Tim Hart, uh, Robert Johnson, uh, what was a bass player called? Rick Kemp, Peter Knight, and uh, Nigel Pegram on drums. And uh, it contained their biggest hit single, the title track, All Around My Hat. And uh, well, it was a good album. It's a little bit um, overproduced. It was produced by Mike Batt, who was um, better known in the UK at the time as being the musical um, coordinator of the, the children's band, The Wombles. Uh, it, it was also a bit of a. He, he did a, some prog rock. So he had a prog rock album out called The Tarot Suite, which I, which I've heard is not great. But um, he, he was a bit of an all rounder, all round musician, writer, producer. So he, he produced this. And I think it was a little bit overproduced, to be honest, a little bit too um, too polished. They lost a bit of their sort of like um, rough edge and uh, spontaneity, I think, uh, with this. But it, it's, it's still a good listen. It's um, it put them on the map. It also tied in with they have their own BBC. TV show as well, which ran for about six six weeks, um, just sh- them showcasing um, English folk songs, which is uh, it's always good. It's always good to. I mean, a lot of people tend to f- tend to lose track of the roots of, uh, of the music of the country they they live in, and it was quite good that English English folk music was just given this boost, and a bit of a makeover. I mean, a lot of this stuff, particularly um, like "All Around My Hat," was was well known and well known tune. 
Uh, there's another track called Hard Times of Old England, second track in, which um, I think was also released as a single, which almost sounds like a boogie, like a, like a status quo kind of riff to it. So they, they really rocked it up. Um, there's um, a good instrumental called Some Waves. There's a wife of Usher as well, Gamble Gold, Robin Hood. Gamble Gold is apparently Robin Hood's cousin. Who would have known, eh? Who would have known this? A legend would have had a legendary cousin. And yeah, it, it, it is a good album. I saw them on this tour. They played a really good tour. Um, uh, back in 75. Yeah, this came, this came out in 75. And um, yeah, it was um, yeah, it was just, just really good. Um, good album. Great times. I enjoyed it. And it was good fun. It's sort of like... Um, my, my, uh, if anyone watching this uh, this channel now knows I've got quite an eclectic taste in music. So I was um, enjoying this alongside the likes of... Uh, Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd and Kiss. So there you go. Number eight of my uh, Steel Ice Band rundown. All around my hat. Okay, now we go to Steel Ice Band Mark II again for my number seven in this rundown. This came out the same year as the Ten Man Mop album, 1971. Earlier in the year, it's Pleased to See the King. Now, there is the, this was their second release. Uh, the first lineup only lasted one album, so they... Um, Drafted in um, Martin Carthy, who that's the chap there, who's a, a legend in um, English folk music, and um, Peter Knight, the chap there, who's a violinist and an uh, occasional mandolinist, I think. Oh, I thought I was going to sneeze then. Uh, um, yeah, this is a really, really cool album. There's some good stuff on here. They um, uh, pulled out all the stops. You've got the, black, the Blacksmith, uh, the version of The Blacksmith that actually also appeared on the first album. This is a, a different version. Um, what are the standout tracks in here? Boys of Bedlam, which um, uh, is an interesting track, has a bit of a um, um, explanation about the history of the track and the, the word Bedlam, of course. So the Bethlehem, the Bethlehem Hospital, and Bedlam is kind of just sound like a, a distortion of the word Bethlehem. Um, dates back to the 16th century, and then it moved to Lambeth. Um, at the uh, now how which, which now houses the Imperial War Museum. So that's the thing about Sea Life Span. They sort of bring all this history in as well. So it's, it's always quite good to read the read the um, read the cover notes. False Night of the Road is a classic folk song. I remember that at school actually. Gosh. and the false uh, the false night of the road. The false night is the devil, and the wee boy failed to answer his questions. He would lose his soul to the devil. That's a familiar ring to it, doesn't it? Is anyone who remembers Robert Johnson? Lark in the Morning, female drummer, The King. Now, The the King is um, an interesting track. It's about the Twelfth uh, Night in Pembrokeshire. The, the, the wren is traditionally symbolised in winter with the, the robin in summer. Um, but uh, I don't know. It's, um, the, the, this goes too far into some of these details. You know, it sounds kind of a bit lost in there. But the, 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 the music is great. I mean, it was a different lineup. There's uh, two new members. They brought in the, the fiddle is a lot more prominent on this album. Couple of jigs in there, but um, yeah, good album and recommend recommended. There's no drums on this album. They had, they had a drummer on the first album, but on this album there aren't any drums. Um, um, for whatever reason, even though there is a track called "Female Drummer," but there's no drums on this. Uh, the drums became a lot more prominent in the later albums, like on "All Around My House" and the, the latest stuff, the classic era. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but yeah, please, please to see the king. That um, is uh, from 1971. That's my album, and this uh, number seven album in my Steel Ice Band ranking. Okay, now then, number six. This was uh, from 1977. Another lineup change. Um, this was lineup one, two. I can't, I've lost track now. I've lost track. It was the only album with this lineup. It came out in 1977. It's called Storm Force Ten. With a lovely um, painting there again by Adrian Chesterman. Uh, it always reminds me of um, if any of you know the um, Ladybird books um, that are around, uh, particularly when I was a kid, and maybe even before. I was that kind of like exciting, stark kind of uh, drawing on it. This one about the the, the weather, uh, the barometer, the weather gauge there. <clears throat> but yeah, this was an interesting album because this this was after the initial. Commercial success with the All Around My House and an album called Rocket Cottage, which came after, which didn't quite make my 10. And um, Peter Knight and uh, Bob Johnson, guitarist and violinist, left left the band. So, okay, 1977, this was the year of punk rock. 
So Steel Ass Band did something very radical and replaced the violin with an accordion. Now that's what I call anarchy in the UK. Um, so the whole sound really changed with this album. It became almost a sea, a sea shanty album, if you like. Um, Bob Johnson was replaced by um, Martin Carthy, who came back for this one album. He was uh, from the Mark II lineup. And uh, yeah, it was just an just, uh, interesting album. Uh, I saw them on this tour as well, and the, the whole mood of the, the, the show had changed. It had changed. It was uh, still rocky. We still had uh, the drums there. There's still a uh, six piece band, still still folk rock, but it had changed with this, uh, just a dynamic, completely different. They even brought a bit of Morris dancing into the in, in, into the show, which is quite interesting. But it's got some uh, great tracks. It's got Awake Awake, uh, Sweep Chin uh, Sweep, which is a uh, chimney sweep, sorry, which is a um, a cappella song. The uh, Wife of the Shoulder, the the the, the Victory, which is about uh, the ship of the same name, because they, they had to bring in some seafaring type um, songs into to so they could you make full use of the accordion sound. And the most interesting track on this, on the side two, the Black Freighter, which is a uh, Bertolt Brecht Vale song, uh, which is I think is it from the from the Three Penny Opera, and it's a great version. I actually heard John Peel play that on his show because John John Peel was a big. Uh, Big fan of uh, folk rock at the time, and he was always playing anything new by um, people like uh, Fairport and Steel Eye and Pentangle, who were another um, kind of folk rock band around at the time. And L Lindy's fan as well, they, they were all part of this scene. Uh, but yeah, that was a really good song, and I think uh, Maddie Pry's voice um, suited that kind of track really well. So it was, um, yeah, it was a re re interesting album, an interesting change of style. Uh, they only, they, that lineup only did the one album. John Kirkpatrick was the accordion player, who's um, a well-regarded um, button player in the in the, in the folk scene. And uh, yeah, great album, great different album for Steel Eye, and uh, number six in my uh, Steel Eye rundown. Okay, now moving on to number five, We're in the top five now. Uh, this was 1973, year of glam rock. <laughs> Steel Eye doing this. This is the year I got into them, but not from anything off this album. Uh, this is uh, Parcel of Rogues, came out in 1973. This uh, lovely um, album sleeve. Who did the sleeve? Um, Graham Burney, who has actually worked with them a few times, actually. Uh, it's got a nice, nice gatefold, the band inside there. This is their, this was their fourth release, and the first album with Steel Ice Band Mark Oh, sorry, the second album with Steel Axe Band, Steel Axe Band Mark Three. Hold on, no, it's their fifth album. Got to get this right. One, two, three, four. This is their fifth album, yeah, but the, um, the first, the second album with Steel Axe Band Mark Three. Ah, oh, God, I, don't know. I get confused. But anyway, yeah, the um, what they did with this, they, um, another one without any drums, really, a bit of percussion here and there, but um, they really got into that kind of electric guitar sound on this, um, a lot more than the previous albums. They were experimenting with different guitar sounds, and um, the, the guitars really came to the forefront on this. Um, lots of wah-wah, lots of distortion. It, it actually got quite heavy in parts, uh, for, for a folk album anyway, and it was um, interesting, an interesting listen, yeah. Although it does stand on the, the title track that starts it off, it's called One Misty Moisty Morning. Uh, which has the, the mandolin there, and you know, Maddie Pryor singing that misty, moisty morning, one when cloudy was the weather. I met with an old man clothed all in leather, and then at the end of it, he gets this grungy guitar sound coming in. Um, not that I would ever um, call Steel Ice Band a grunge act, but there's, there's um, some real hard out guitar here. Alison Gross, uh, third track in is, uh, sorry, second track in is a um, interesting track. Which I think was based on a painting. I'm not quite sure, but uh, a lot of these songs do have a um, sort of like vague history behind them. But um, always, always very interesting. Uh, there's an instrumental track called "Robbery of Violins" at the end, where they re they mix the violin because um, uh, Peter Knight was with them on this album, obviously. So they're doing the guitar and the violin there together, which is all quite good. Um, Rogues in a Nation. Cameo for France is a good one where they actually do a bit of accordion on that, which they they brought back into the live um, show on the Storm Force 10 tour because it had accordion in it. I'm not quite sure they played accordion on it, actually. That's mentioned here anyway. But, um, yeah, it was a good album, good album. I really enjoyed listening to this. And, um, 
it's number five, top five in my uh, Steel Last Man rundown. Well worth investigating that one. Okay, number four in the rundown is their debut album, Hark of the Village Wait. Uh, featuring their original lineup and the only one to feature that lineup. Maddie Pryor and Tim Hart had been um, touring as a duo for many years. Well, maybe a well, few years, I don't, know, I don't know how long, in the 60s, around the folk clubs. As had um, um, Terry and Gay Woods. So and they were brought together. There's old uh, Ashley Hutchins at the end there with his shades on again. He brought them all together for this album. It's really good. I'm not quite sure... Um, why only lasted for one lineup? I don't know whether there's any bickering going on between them because two female singers, two female lead singers, were sharing vocals a bit. Uh, the Blacksmith um, features on here a different version to the um, Please to See the King album. But this this is a great album. They have a drummer on here who plays drums on this, I can't remember. Might be Jerry Conway. Actually, I think the, the drumming was perhaps shared between um, Jerry Conway and Dave Mattox. Who were both involved with the Fairport Convention, so um, they were they were the hired hand on this album. Uh, the, the 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 title "Hark the Village Wait" um, is a bit misleading. Um, when I first heard that, I thought, "Oh, well, the village is waiting for something." Well, no, the the village wait. The the, the word "wait" means a, um, a small group of musicians connected to a town. It's like the uh, almost like the local brass band or something. Uh, it's um, it's an old. I don't know, it's medieval or whatever, but um, that's what a wait was. A wait was a group of musicians that was connected to a particular town at the time. And, um, yeah, I mean, it was a good start. Obviously, I didn't hear it at the time. Um, I got it all in... Ret- oh, the, the, these albums are all rele- originally released on the BNC, BC record label, then re-released on uh, the Mooncrest label. And I always, I always used to love the Mooncrest logo there. I was around me with 2000 on Space Odyssey's so opening scene. So the first three albums were... Um, I have on the Mooncrest logo. But you got some great, great songs on here. you got The Fisherman's Wife, The Black Leg Miner, which is a classic um, uh, Miner Strike type song. The Black Leg Miner, Dark Hard Sailor, um, Couples Home Fair, All Things Are Quite Silent, which is a great track. Uh, My Johnny Was a Shoemaker, which is a great track. Lowlands of Holland, just great. It's great, great stuff. Um, uh, after the split, uh, Gay Woods, I think Terry and Gay Woods eventually divorced or whatever. Gay Woods, I've no idea what happened to her. She kind of like disappeared. But Terry Woods later appeared um, in the Pogues. So he he was still quite active right through into the 80s and 90s. Um, of course, the others um, carried on. Um, Maddie Pryor and Tim Hart and um, Ash Hutchins carried on in the next incarnation of Steel Eye. But uh, it was only really Maddie and Tim carried on into the, the greatest success in the mid-70s. But um, anyway... This is this is really worth looking into. This is a great a great um, landmark of English folk rock music. Really, the first first Eli album from nineteen seventy. Hark the village wait, and it is number four in my Eli rundown. Well, okay, get to the, the good stuff now. Number th- uh, number three is um, the like All Around My Hat was released in nineteen seventy five. This came out earlier in the same year. Commoners Crown. Which is uh, with the classic lineup again. There was a uh, six six members of the classic lineup. I'll mention them on uh, in a minute. Actually, who who was in the lineup? And uh, look at that sleeve. It's a lovely sleeve. The sleeve uh, won an award. I'm not quite sure which one. It's done by Shirt Sleeve Studios, and it's made up of little tiny figures, uh, little plastic. I assume they're plastic little figures that you get in them um, sets, and then they're painted gold, and made this um, wonderful sculpture. Um, which um, I thought thought was brilliant. I remember having a a poster of that in my my bedroom when I was a teenager, (laughs) next to all my uh, Slade and Suzy Quattro posters. But yeah, this was a brilliant album. This was a really, really cool album. Um, It's got some good stuff on here. Little Sir Hugh opens it. Back goes to Limerick, which was an interesting little take on um, Bark's music. They basically folks up a bit of Bark and uh, did it in the style of a, a Limerick jig almost. Long Lankin, which is one of those classic uh, Steel Eye tracks. He got the Gouty Farmer. Demon Lover, which was um, the way they interpreted that was almost like a like a, a really cool pop tune, actually. It, it, uh, it was really, really good. And um, one interesting track on here closes the album. It's called New York Girls. And the reason it's interesting because it has a guest appearance by um, Peter Sellers <laughs> from, from the Goons. 
who apparently was a big Steel House Man fan, and also played the ukulele. So they thought, oh, what, a, what a great ruse it would be to get him on here to um, play ukulele on the final track. And he, he does speak a little bit on it, he doesn't, doesn't sing at all. Um, but uh, you hear him at the end, he sort of recites something from one of his uh, characters from The Goons at the end. But uh, I thought it was, it was quite a bizarre thing to have old Peter Sellers there playing ukulele on the, on the final track. But there you go. Uh, there, are, there is another um, unusual uh, guest appearance coming up on my next album as well, actually. You Have Been Warned. But yeah, well, it is a great album. This is really one, this is one of their classic albums, actually. It's a classic Steel Arts Man album from 1975, Commoners Crown. Listen to it tomorrow. And that's number three in my uh, Steel Arts Man rundown. Okay, my next album is, um, well, my next two. Just absolute classic Steel Eye stuff, and these are <clears throat> these are the two albums I would recommend recommend for anyone to get into straight away. Uh, number two in this rundown is Night Seventy Four's Now We Are Six, which um, the title refers to their lineup. This is um, Mark IV, the Mark IV lineup, where they were actually six members, and this is the one they had a, the first time they had a full time drummer, Nigel Pegram had joined the band. Now this lineup. Featured Maddy Pryor vocals, Tim Hart vocals, guitar, and dulcimer. Peter Knights on um, violin, and I think occasional mandolin. Robert Johnson on guitars, and Nigel Pegram on drums. Oh, and Rick Kemp on bass. Um, considered to be the, the classic Steel Eye lineup. This is the one that reformed for the Sales of Silver album. Produced by Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull. I mean, they were on Chrysalis, the Chrysalis record label, as were Jethro Tull, so that's probably the, uh, the connection there. But this really was um, their first proper classic folk rock um, album, really. Starts off with 700 Elves, great track, uh, Edwin, Drink Down the Moon, which is just an amazing song, which is, I think, actually a portmanteau of two songs. I uh, can't remember the title of them both, but um, that is two, two folk songs stuck together. Slow song and a fast song, so it's, it starts off pretty slow. Quite a moody song because uh, Nigel Pegram, apart from being um, the drummer of the band, he also used to play um, woodwinds as well. He played flute and um, I think he plays clarinet on that, or is it oboe? It might be oboe. Um, but yeah, great, great song. And the, the side one finishes with Thomas Arimer, which is uh, considered what from not uh, not only one of the classic folk rock. Uh, renditions, but probably the you know the Thomas and Rhyme is just the the classic Steel Ice Band song really, and the many people. It's not particularly my favourite, but it's it's out there as a that had that does definitely have a almost a heavy metal riff to it. But um, it was a, it was released as a single. I think it hit the chart, made the charts, but um, it was one of their earlier hits. But um, great track. Side two opens with the Moon Coin Jig. Which is a typical mandolin jig, which is really cool. Longer growing, two magicians, which is a, a great song about two magicians which, which turn turn into different things. Um, I remember them doing that live. It was, it was really good, really good live track. And I didn't see them on, the, on this tour. I have seen them on um, quite a few tours, but I didn't see them on this one. Um, then um, the closing track on this, which features um, that another guest musician. Now the closing track on here is um, the Phil Spector song "To Know Him Is to Love Him," uh, which was an unu unusual choice um, in the eyes of many people. I thought, what the hell is that doing on a folk album? But apparently, that's what they used to do live. I've never seen them do it live actually. But apparently, in the early days, they used to finish off their show, they then come back for an encore and do a couple of rock and roll standards in the folk style. That was what they used to do. So that it was to some people, it was, oh yeah, it's a rock and roll standard. But the interesting thing about this was it actually featured David Bowie on saxophone. <laughs> And so you got Ian Anderson producing it, and David Bowie turning up as a guest appearance on saxophone, so it makes it quite an interesting, interesting listen. Uh, the downside of this album, the great sleeve, not another shirt sleeve, studio sleeve here, because the back made to look like the back of the um, painting. As well. It's like a, some sort of, um, I couldn't give a, an ear on that style of um, uh, illustration there, but on the back it's meant to look like a uh, back of the frame. Um... The, the downside of this is these two bizarre tracks on it. Well, uh, now we are six. Um, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Yes, twinkle, twinkle, little star. And they're purportedly be, to be done by the St Eli Primary School Junior Choir, which is a complete ruse because um, it's actually the band singing in children children style voices, and it's it is very very silly and doesn't really need to be here to be honest. Um, 
Uh, a lot of people, I've, I've read a lot of people have just complained about that scene. So it's just just a waste of waste of uh, waste of space. Really, shouldn't they need to be there? They're not really long tracks, but they're a bit they're a bit, they're a bit annoying, really. But um, anyway, they're there. Not much you can do about it. But anyway, yeah, great a great album. Now we are six. A steel ice band from nineteen seventy four. It's my number two. Which brings me to my favourite Steel Ice Band album. This is the one that um, I uh, got into them with. I got, it was actually it was released in '72, but I didn't get into it until um, a year later because of a single that was released off it, the, Christ- the aforementioned Christmas single. Uh, the album is Below the Salt, and it was the the first release with Steel Ice Band Mark Three. Yeah, I've got that record it right this time. So it's basically the classic lineup, but without Nigel Pegram on drums. And they did two albums of this lineup, the other one being Parcel of Rogues. And it's just a brilliant album. And uh, the track I, um, I, talk, I was talking about before is Gaudete, which was released as a single in 1973 and became a, a Christmas hit. Um, I think it made the top 20. It wasn't a huge hit, but it was a proper Christmas hit. Um, it was like Gaudete. Latin for rejoice, and it was all about the the birth of um, the birth of Jesus. Not many Christmas songs mention that, do they? Really, but um, it was it was an a cappella song. It was um, not only was it um, one of the uh, very rare a cappella hits in the UK in the English charts. It was also one of the first hits to actually be uh, completely in Latin. Um, the single version was a different recording, I think, or a different a different mix to the album version. The album version, it's. Um, Fades in and fades out as though they are um, minstrels walking down the street and you hear them coming up and then going past, walking past. So it kind of fades in and fades out. I don't know how many verses there are. Yeah, how many verses are there? There are one, two, three, four, I think four verses and the chorus repeat, the Gaudete chorus. But um, yeah, that's that's how I, and I was quite intrigued by it. I was just intrigued by this um, this band and um, saw this in my uh, one of the local record shops and... Um, Purchased it and that just became I became hooked on the Steel Ice Band. And uh, there's a lot of them. Starts off with Spotted Cow, we got Rosebud in June, a couple of jigs thrown in, of course. Then uh, Sheep Crook and Black Dog and the Royal Forester. And the Royal Forester, I remember them opening a few shows of that. That was one of their um, show openers, even in later years when they had a drummer. Uh, the epic track for me is um, first track side two, King Henry. Which uh, is um, it's a child ballad, child ballad number thirty-two, if you're keeping track, uh, from the English and Scottish popular ballads, and uh, it's it's basically all about um, King Henry uh, put, um, sort of like meets this meets this awful sort of like a witch character, and uh, she demands all these things of him, and then ends up sleeping with him, and then waking up in a morning as a beautiful maiden. Lots of these songs, lots of these folk songs are all about things like that. Uh, the Royal Forester, a little bit like that, Spotted Cow. One morning in the month of June, as from my cot I strayed, just at the dawning of the day, I met with a charming maid. They're all in here, all these kind of songs. But um, side two is probably the stronger um, um, side of this album. you got King Henry opening up, it's a bit of an ep- epic track, it's about eight minutes long, I think. Then you got Gaudete. And then John Barleycorn, uh, which is... Um, it's a collection from um, a guy called Fred Fred Harmer, and um, it's um, I think tra- the band Traffic also featured the John Barleycorn uh, version of this, and it's all about giving um, Bar- Barleycorn real ale, which you know, was brewed from um, barley at the time. Um, it gives it gives it a personality, and it's all about John John Barleycorn. Uh, I think John Ballack almost dies a traffic version, and um, they put him in the the, the final track. Is um, they work their will on John Ballack on, but he lives to tell the tale, for they pour him out in an old bound jug, and they call him home brewed ale. So um, it was just giving giving uh, ale a personality, really giving a person, and then it ends with the saucy sailor. Now about the title, below the salt, um, comes from medieval times about him. Um, it's a class thing, and uh, if you I'll double, you know, get your full sleeve. Uh, the salt in the middle there, um, middle of the table. Salt at the time was um, was quite a, a sort of like a um, much sought after commodity. It was quite you know quite a thing to have a bowl of salt on the table, and um, 
the term below the salt meant uh, people who sat below the salt were the um, usually the, the servants and the um, the lower ends of the of the, the household would uh, sit below the salt, where the um, upper members, the aristocracy, would sit above the salt. So that's the last shot again on the back. You've got the band there playing both parts with trick photography. Uh, um, here they're the aristocratic side of the family, and at the other end they are the uh, the workers. The old maddie has got a feet on the table, probably wouldn't have been allowed. But uh, yeah, it's just a term that comes from that really. If you sit, you're sitting below the salt, you are uh, the lower end of the household. And they're using their hands. And they're, well, they're always using their hands, aren't they? But um, it's probably uh, a bit of a discrepancy of the type of food they've been given as well, I imagine. But anyway, there we are. That's my favourite Steel House Man album. I thoroughly recommend anyone listen to that if they want to get into a bit of old English folk rock music. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's my top ten Steel House Man albums, studio albums, so um, hope you enjoyed that, uh, I think I was babbling on a bit there, losing my way, but um, anyway, uh, I was trying to, I was trying to um, put, commit everything to memory on that one, because I've been a Steel House Band fan uh, for that era, I was, I was quite, I wouldn't say obsessed with them, I was, I was quite into them, and I read up a lot, a lot about them, I did see them a lot in concert, and so, yeah, they're a, they're a good band, I mean, they've been well respected, um, three members now are MBEs, so um, they've obviously been recognised by, uh, by a lot of people. Uh, like I say, they're still going. So um, if, if you see Steel Ice Band come into your town, I'd recommend you go and see them. I think they're a good, good fun band to go and see. Anyway, that's me for now. Thank you for being there. Ashton London signing off. Um, there's more Top Tens coming soon. Bye for now. <laughs>